Welcome back, WFUV 90.7 FM. This is One on One, New York's longest running sports call in show. Andrew Posadas, Sam Davis. And now it is my pleasure to welcome our next guest. He is a reporter for the New York Daily News, Brooklyn Nets, NBA Beat. If you need the news, he's got the scoop. Christian Winfield. Christian, appreciate you taking the time to sure. talk some hoops. Appreciate you guys for having me, man. How you guys doing? Doing well. Can't complain. Doing well. But I think people who can complain right now, though, Christian, if that gets my first question, is the media members covering the Brooklyn Nets. As we know, the big news story, Kyrie Irving, after getting fined $25,000 from the league for not speaking to the media members, he went on IG again and on his Instagram live, on his Instagram story, excuse me, said that basically that the media members are all pawns and it's not worth his time to talk to media members. Christian, as somebody who covers the Nets, oh, how do you yeah. feel about Kyrie's cryptic messages? I mean, I, it's, a, it's a tough, it's an interesting question, right? It's an interesting situation, right? Like as my job as a beat reporter is to cover this team, right? And part of that is talking to these guys and having access to these guys. And one person doesn't necessarily want to talk to the media for, for whatever reasons. And, and some of the, those reasons are warranted, right? When you look at the entire, uh, let's just call it a, a snafu uh, in the lead up to the Orlando bubble when Kyrie is voicing his opinion about a hey, guy shouldn't go back to play basketball for X, Y, Z reason. Uh, and then one side calls him a disruptor and then somebody else calls him pretty much stupid, right? So, it, I mean, you can understand from his perspective how he, you know what I'm saying? At a certain point, you get tired of, of certain people, you know, saying certain things. And then there's, but there's also just the history of everywhere he's been. Uh, and he's just had this type of, of, of what's a combustible relationship with the media. You know what I'm saying? But going back to Cleveland, going back to Boston, and now here in Brooklyn. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure this is a situation that's going to resolve itself. Um, and it, it would be a shame for it not to. You know what I'm saying? Kyrie just got here last season, 20 games. He only played a handful of them in Brooklyn. But, I mean, just the energy he brings to that arena, you know, the type of player he is, uh, what he's able to do out there on the floor that a lot of other guys can't do is just, like, bring that entertainment value. And you want to talk to the guy who's bringing the most, the majority of that entertainment value. So for him not to be addressing media, uh, I mean, again, I don't think it's going to be something that lasts an entire season. I'm not sure if the Nets are going to be, you know, it wasn't just him that was fined. It was the Nets organization as well. They split that $50,000 fine. Um, and obviously when you look at it, you know, $25,000 to someone who signed a $140 million contract doesn't sound like much, but when you add it up, if he decides not to talk for 72 games, that's basically, you know, almost $2 million that he's going to be paying. Now, mind you, that's the other side of this thing, right? Is that, yes, he's getting fined, but th that fine money is going to charity, right? And Kyrie would, you know, he's a guy who makes charitable donations on his own, right? So if not, if not talking to the media means donation money going to charity, then I'm not sure that's an issue for Kyrie. But at the same time, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting situation we're in. Um, and as reporters, it's not just myself. There's a lot of good reporters yeah. uh, on this net speed, and we're just going to find a way to navigate it regardless of however it plays out. From, from one superstar to the other here, Kevin Durant obviously coming back from injury this season. Nets fans are, are hopeful for serious playoff contention. Uh, you mentioned in a recent article on KD, the Achilles injury is known to be very difficult for players to come back from, especially with Durant being his early 30s. So, so how do you expect him to respond to this, se uh, this season with the Achilles? You know, I, I think that one interesting part of Kevin Durant's rehab is just that his game isn't necessarily predicated on super athleticism, right? This is a guy who's a seven-foot guard, basically, who can shoot over anybody. Right. I think that's part of it right there. And, and when you just look at other guys who, who've had their, their careers, I mean, the, 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 the popular mention is Kobe, RIP to a legend. Um, you know, the Achilles was the beginning kind of of the end of his of his prime. Um, and if you just go back in history, you see more examples of that. Um, but there is one big example, right? Dominique Wilkins is a guy who got hurt at age 32, tore his Achilles, came back and averaged 30 points a game the next season. You know, so there is a precedent for guys coming back from it. Um, and when you just talk to guys who have been able to be there and, and, and actually train with them, they're all saying the same thing. Mind you, they're supposed to say this, right? They're not supposed to come out there and say, hey, Kevin Durant looks terrible. He's going to stink it up. But, I mean, they're all saying the same thing. He looks like the guy who was dropping 30 a game before he got hurt. So, you know, I mean, this is one of those situations where we're only going to be able to see as it, as it goes. You know what I'm saying? It's not like we're there. It's not like we're there 
uh, during training camp because of the pandemic. We're not, you know, our access is pretty limited. Uh, but judging from what other guys have been able to say, um, I think it's interesting. Uh, I'm, you guys may or may not have seen this story. We got a chance to talk to Chris Chioza, and uh, Chris Chioza was on the so-called extra work group that Kevin Durant would work out with uh, while he was rehabbing. And he was like, hey, man, before when we were working out with him in this extra work group, uh, you know, he was a little hesitant. He wasn't trying to force contact. He was still trying to figure out where his body's at. And now he's like, hey, man, he's, he's over here forcing the contact. He's picking the shots he wants to choose. Um, and I think that's a, a step. But now it's, okay, you're, you're doing this against practice teams, against your own guys. Now let's see how it looks when you're playing against guys who don't want you to get to that spot. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I think he's going to be okay, but I'm also going on the words of people that, you know, have to sell him as being something uh, so, uh, like in some semblance of what he was before. So it'll be fun to watch for sure. Here talking with Brooklyn Nets beat reporter Christian Winfield. Christian, I had the opportunity to be on that Zoom call with Sean Marks in November alongside you and everyone else sure. where Sean Marks basically iterated that he wasn't willing to mortgage the future in order to get James Harden. Now we know right. James Harden wants out of Houston and Brooklyn is one of his preferred destinations. In your opinion, where do you draw the line from, you know, adding that third superstar to KD and Kyrie and maybe mortgaging too much where you might be shooting yourself in the foot down the line? That's an interesting question because it all depends on whether you think James Harden is the type of player that can actually lead this team to a championship. Well, not to say lead, right? Because this team is going to be led by Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. You, you're banking on James Harden being the guy who can make the difference. If you don't think what you have right now is enough, and that's where like the line kind of gets blurred, as you say, because if you're going to trade for a star like a James Harden or call it a Bradley Beal, you're going to have to pay, right? And that payment, no matter what it is, is going to be in the form of mortgaging your future. These teams are not going to accept anything short of young talent and draft picks. And when you give up too many draft picks, that's considered mortgaging your future. But on the flip side, if you believe that that player can get you over the hump and win a championship, I mean, you have to be willing to make that bet, right? And on top of that, um, it, I mean, there really, there really isn't, isn't an on top of that. You know, like at that point, you're betting on either Karis LeVert uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, Jared Allen, those guys being able to actually develop into the star that you think is going to be that third piece, or you're betting that that superstar that that's out there still is going to be the guy. Um, I don't think there is a, a an option. I don't think there is a cutoff for these guys, right? Because at the end of the day, for the next three years, the next draft picks are going to stink, right? Well, not stink, but they're going to be late first rounders at best. Um, and then on top of that, you have to you got to give you have to pay to play right you're not getting James Harden just by matching the the dollar amount that's not how it works you've got to give something up that actually makes sense um so I'm not sure there is a, a a scenario where the Nets aren't going to be able to aren't going to mortgage their future for a third star it, it's just more of a does that star fit into the grand scheme of what we're trying of what they're trying to do um and I think at this point you know you've got so many players they're probably going to go into the season the way everything is right now and then see how things look uh, up until the trade deadline, uh, which would be the smartest thing to do. Um, and then from there, if you think if this team, if by the trade deadline, this team is 130 and only lost six, then you keep it together and go for it. So, I mean, the Nets have a lot of flexibility right now. They've got a lot of players on, on longer term contracts. They just, it, it's, it's interesting because Sean Marks is out here saying, hey, you know, we, we're, we're, not, we're not against making trades, be it smaller or larger ones. So that kind of looms large over the entire picture. But at the same time, uh, you've got to figure out what the team is going to look like. And you're not going to know that until you get to at least game 10, game 15, game 20 of the regular season. We talked about Kyrie refusing to talk to the media. We also all remember uh, Kyrie after the hiring of, of Steve Nash, the new coach, saying he doesn't see the Nets as having a head coach. Uh, uh, Steve Nash is the coach for, the, for this season. So how do you expect his first year to go? And, and how do you think his relationship is going to be with Kyrie and with KD and with the, the rest of the team? You know, there, there's a huge question mark, and, and Steve Nash is part of that because he's never been a head coach. He's never been an assistant coach, and he really his, his, his I guess, his history in the NBA outside of being a player is somewhat limited. Now you can't discount what he was able to do as a player, right? This guy was one of the best point guards of all time, Hall of Famer, back-to-back -back, uh, MVP winner. Um, and, and Sean Mark said something interesting once. He said, you know, we're, we're looking for a conductor. We're looking for somebody who can kind of tap into all the different 
facets of everybody on the roster and, and kind of just make them mesh well together. You know, it's not like Steve has to go out there and create a new offense from scratch or create a new defense or reinvent the wheel or anything like that. That's not necessary. When you've got guys like KD, Kyrie, Karis, Spencer, all these guys, you, you don't really have to do too much other than make sure everybody's on the same page, manage the rotations, assign roles, and uh, make sure guys are, are tuned into one another. And I think that's what we're going to see from Steve Nash. Um, whether he's going to be a guy who's out there yelling at refs or, or not, I have no idea. You know, we don't know what kind of coach he's going to be in that regard. But he's a smart guy. I mean, you don't, you don't need to have three years, four years, five years as, as an assistant coach to necessarily be the type of person that you want for this coach. And, and it's interesting, right? I, there's so many different interesting things about this Nets team, and, and Steve Nash is the head coach is one of them. Because when you think about basketball minds, you know, Steve Nash is near the top of that list. You know what I'm saying? Just the type of player he was, how he had to use – his mind because he wasn't the the most explosive athlete and the way he was able to get the guys around him, he was able to get the best out of them uh, and really lead them. Now he never was able to win them a championship. Uh, Mike D'Antoni has never been able to win a championship. Mark Stoudemire never won a championship. So these are things that we're going to have to see. But at the end of the day, you've got KD and Kyrie, two guys who have won championships in their careers. Um, and you're going to be leaning on them. So whether Steve Nash is actually the head coach or whether it's Kyrie or whether it's KD on any given day, who knows? Um, I do know one thing that KD and Kyrie wanted in a head coach was, was somebody who was just going to listen, right? And that was part of the issue that, you know, came out with, with KD and Kyrie and some of the other guys on the roster as it pertained to Kenny Atkinson. You know, he wasn't necessarily one who was listening to his guys and, and trying to, you know what I'm saying? I, I would say it, it's interesting. Um, I do think that Steve is going to be a, a different, he's kind of going to be a, a breath of fresh air for those types of guys. But now it's also, how do you balance that with developing the other guys on the roster? Because these guys only have a three-year three year window, right? You've got them for three years. Now, what do you do? Um, so it, it's a lot to to watch. Uh, I, think, I think Steve, I wouldn't say Steve Nash is under pressure, but there is also the conversation of, hey, there were a whole bunch of other you know, more experienced candidates who were available to be able to take that job. So for somebody to just step into those shoes so soon, um, it's going to be, it, it, I keep using the word interesting, but that's where this Nets team is right now. We There's so much that we don't know about them. And right now, all, all we're going to be able to do is watch and see it unfold. And, and that's what I want to ask you, Christian. If they don't make any more moves, they still have two superstars in Katie and Kyrie. Mm -hmm. You got pieces around them, Dimwitty, Jaron Allen, Karis LeVert, yeah. uh, DeAndre Jordan being that locker room presence. Where do you put this team when it comes to the conversation of the best in the East coming into this season? Um, that, that's, a, that's a tough question. If you're asking me right now, I have them near the top um, because automatically I, I thought the Bucks won in free agency up until the whole Bogdan Bogdanovich thing fell through. I thought that was a piece that they really needed. Um, but still, you add Drew Holiday to that mix. You've got Giannis, whose work speaks for itself. You still have Chris Middleton. Uh, and you've got Mike Budenholzer as the head coach. I think that team has as good a chance as anybody. But after that, there's just like a lot of drop off when it comes to star power, right? You obviously you've got Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid in Philly, but they still have to prove that they're a team that can actually make it work around those two guys. You do have the Boston is going to be tough because you've got Kemba Walker, you've got Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, uh, but those guys didn't necessarily rise to the occasion last year either, right? And you've got Miami, who somehow is still an underdog, even though they made it to the NBA Finals last year. Um, they've still got to prove that they can get back and that it wasn't a fluke. And now you've got the Nets, who have zero chemistry pretty much. Well, I wouldn't say zero, right? Because a large chunk of that core played together last year. But yeah. you're bringing in two guys who are going to play 30 minutes at least a night. And then you brought in another two free agents with Landry Shamit and Bruce Brown. And those two guys have to find their own minutes too. So uh, it, it's a, it's going to be a, you know, from, from everything I've heard from players who've been able to talk so far, they're all saying it's been a competitive training camp in that guys are competing and they're known. It's, it's not a secret. You know what I'm saying? Not everyone is going to be on this team. Somebody's probably going to get traded. Guys are going to get cut. Um, so it, it's more so figuring out which pieces fit best together, whether Sean actually went out there and addressed all the needs. I think, when you go get a guy like Landry Shaman as a sharpshooter, that's always good. You can't have enough shooters. Uh, when you get a guy like Bruce Brown who plays great defense and can move the ball and can knock down a three, that's always a great thing. And then you go get a guy like Jeff Green, you know what I'm saying, quality veteran, spaces the floor out, can defend a couple of different positions. That's also a great pickup. But now you've got so much overlap, right? You've got about four or five different guys that can play, that can play point guard. You've got four or five different sharpshooters who all want to play. You've got a bunch of different forwards, and then you've got a bunch of different guys who feel like they can knock down the last shot if they need to. So uh, I think this is why we're, we're seeing guys say, hey, you know, that you know, 
thinking about it is one thing, but actually getting on the floor and watching it happen uh, is another. And it, it all just boils down. Preseason is going to be fun, but I don't think preseason is going to be too big of a look into what this team is going to be. I think around game 15, uh, we'll see where this team is and if they really need some more trades. If the Nets are going to contend in the, in the Eastern Conference, what's what's one thing that you want to see from them or hope to see from them? And then what's one thing that you think they can't afford to do this coming season if they want to contend? One thing I need to see from the Nets is they would need to be at least a top 10 defensive team. I think last season they finished around 19. I could be wrong. I think 19 is where they finished. But championships are won on defense. And, and when you just look at this, this staff, you've got Steve Nash, who is, you know what I'm saying, by all intents and purposes, not – a, a quality, I wouldn't say quality, but he's not known for what he did on the defensive end. Mike D'Antoni is historically known as a defensive versus head coach, right? So you've got guys who are preaching defense, right? And you've got Steve Nash saying, hey, we're trying to do some new things. And they're talking about this saying, hey, we're trying to implement, Landry Shamit comes in and he says, hey, you know, we're running a defense now that I've never seen before, which is cool, but is it going to work? And if you're not, I mean, obviously you've got all these offensive weapons. You could go out there and try to gun for 150 on any given night. But at the end of the day, that's not what's going to win you a championship. You've got to have that commitment to the defensive end of the ball and you've got to have that buy-in. Um, and then you've got to have that camaraderie. And I think that's what's going to have to be built. You know what I'm saying? When you have trade rumors like that like have been out this year, you know, guys are human. Yes, it's their job to come in and be professionals and go to work every day. But, you know, I was, we, were, we asked Karis about it not so long ago. He goes, yo, everywhere I look, I look on TV, I look on my phone, I look on Instagram, people are talking about me potentially being traded for James Harden. So how long is that going to take to boil over? And when are we going to start seeing some of those celebration or, 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 or just those moments of team bonding, right? That's what you need to see. You need to see a team that's connected. Um, and, and that's, those are two things that I think, I think connect connectivity and, and really just like intention on, on the defensive end are two things that will show me that they're on the right path. I forgot the second part of your question. Uh, it was just one thing that maybe they couldn't afford to do. Um, that's a good question. One thing this team can't afford to do is not hash out roles, right? Like everyone needs to know what they, and I think that was part of the issue last year. Um, when you've got so many guys who can do so many different things, um, you're going to have overlap in where guys think they fit in versus where they actually fit in. Now you've added four new guys into the mix because basically Kyrie Irving played 20 games. That doesn't count. Kevin Durant is coming for the first season and then they're two free agent acquisitions. So I think I counted it. The Nets have about 16 guys on this roster that could get playing time in any, in, on any other team. Right. And that's obviously that's including KD and Kyrie, but even towards the bottom of that roster, Rodion's Kuruks can play. He can play ball in this league. It's just all about opportunity. Uh, Jeff Green, new guy who comes in, you know, Landry Shabbat, Bruce Brown, those guys came from situations where they were playing nearly 30 minutes a night. Those minutes aren't going to be available. So the one thing they can't afford to do is have one guy thinking that he's, his, his time is coming and then that time is never really coming. I don't think this team can enter the season as is with this roster as is, you know, I think you've got so many different guys in that on that lineup uh, or on the roster right now that can actually make an impact where they are or anywhere else. Uh, I'm not sure they can go into the season like this, but if they do and they have the right buy in, they'll have the deepest roster in the NBA easily. Right. So I, I think one thing that they can't afford to do is not have that buy in to the, the bigger picture of everyone sacrificing and wanting to win a championship. Um, and if they can get over that and put all the egos aside, I think this team would be just fine. Here talking with Christian Winfield. And Christian, I kind of want to branch out now to storylines around the league. So, I think the main one is we mentioned some of the other teams in the East. One of those teams, Milwaukee, you mentioned Giannis. And Giannis has that December 21st deadline to sign his Supermax. And you mentioned they weren't able to get Bogdan Bogdanovich in that sign and trade. They still added Drew Holiday. And this is still a team that has championship aspirations. In your opinion, if the Bucs get anything less than an NBA Finals appearance, is Giannis gone? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I could even see Giannis leaving if they lose in the finals. Right. This, right now, the Bucs have a very small bar and it's winning a championship. Right. Anything less than that. It's like, why am I here? Um, for, for Giannis, I'm not sure what else you can do to appease him. You went and you got what you thought was a, a quality. And I love Drew Holiday. I think he's going to be a huge difference at the one. But 
it, it's tough. You've got Chris Middleton and, and I don't want to, you know, indict Chris Middleton or anything like that. But when you sign a contract like, like what he signed and when you sign a contract like what Tobias Harris signs and you guys don't perform up to the level of that number, then there's automatically going to be a spotlight on you, especially when you've got a, a super max guy who's saying we need to do whatever we can to win a championship, right? If Chris Middleton isn't the guy that's going to get Giannis over the hump, if I'm the Bucks, I'm looking at Chris Middleton like, okay, well, if it's not him, can we move him around and find something else? Or what else can we do to get Giannis uh, a championship, right? And if that's not the case, if they don't win at all, that's that's why, like, if you're the Bucks and Giannis is assigned that super match, you seriously have to contemplate, yo, is this somebody that we trade? Because if he leaves you for nothing, you you don't get a Giannis on the Kumpo very often, right? They got they got lucky that he fell down. I think they drafted him 13th. They got lucky that he fell to 13th, that so many people didn't have the foresight to know that he turned into this type of player. And that type of luck doesn't happen again. Versus if you trade him, you can get, you still have Drew Holiday, you still have Chris Middleton, you still have all these other pieces and you'll get some more. You'll still be relevant and competing in the playoffs for a long time. So it, it, it depends. Uh, if I'm the Bucs, I'd be scared to death if Giannis doesn't sign that Supermax on. I think his 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 deadline's coming up soon, right? It's on the 21st. Yeah, the 21st, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah they, they're under the gun right now. So if he doesn't sign that, that trade deadline is is the next big date. Uh, and And they've got some decisions to make for sure. Yeah, and looking over in the Western Conference, obviously the West is loaded right now. Phoenix mm-hmm. has gotten better. Portland mm-hmm. is re up. They added Robert Covington. Mm-hmm. You still have Denver. The Clippers aren't going anywhere. <laughs> but the Lakers, again, it's crazy to think about it, but they might be better now than they were, what, 72 days ago yeah. when they won the championship in the bubble. They add Schroeder. They add Montrez at Harrell. They're adding Mark Gasol. They might add Pau too in the next few days. In your opinion, for LeBron James going into year 18 and AD kind of ascending now into his superstar status when people were questioning his playoff record, what do you think about the Lakers' chances of getting that second title and LeBron repeating? If I could bet all of my future <laughs> earnings and just hedge them on injury, right? If somebody gets injured, I, I don't want the, the bet to go through. But if everybody <laughs> is healthy and the Lakers, and I could bet every, every dollar that I'd make from now until – year 20, I don't even know, 20, 2100, put it that way. I'll take it. You know what I'm saying? Like the Lakers, number one, even if they didn't have the offseason they already had, I was thinking, okay, they're probably going to repeat. You go get Dennis Schroeder, who's a six man of the year candidate every year. You get Montrez Harrell, who just won the award. You go get, you go get Marcus Gasol, who's one of the better defensive minds, even if he's older, right? He still thinks like a defensive player of the year because he won that award before. Um, the Lakers are just loaded again, right? And they didn't need a third star, right? They just needed to plug in the holes. They realized, okay, well, we need some depth. Let's, let's go get that. Um, and, and look at them. Now, I don't think it's going to be an easy path to the finals at all. Um, we just look around. Number one, I think the Nuggets are coming again, right? I think last, I think what we saw in the bubble was their coming out party, both for Jokic. Well, we already knew what Jokic was, but I think Jamal Murray had a chip on his shoulder just because I don't think guys consider him a top tier point guard. And if you don't have him in your top, at this point, top five, Jamal Murray might be a top five point guard in this league based on what he was yeah. able to do in that bubble. Um, he, I think that's a team to watch out for. I, I think Utah, Utah has been a team I've been, I've been slowly, I've been silently just like championing as a, as a dark horse. I think last year they would have made a, a deeper run if, if Bogdanovich didn't get hurt or whatever it was that was keeping him out of the ball. But that's a team uh, that you got to watch out for. But at the end of the day, I don't think anybody can stop the Lakers. You talk about the Clippers being around for a long time. The only person that's really long, around for a long time is Paul George. <laughs> he signed that five. Cashed years. out. Yeah, and, and I mean, you're not mad if you're him or if you're the Clippers, right? Because the, if you're the Clippers, you're, you're getting a star who wants to be a Clipper uh, for forever, which is cool and all. But that's a star that hasn't necessarily proven that he can win, right? So I'm not making any bets on the Clippers uh, until Paul George shows me a different side of him. Um, other than that, let me see. I think Portland is gonna be is gonna be sneakily fun, um, but I'm not sold on Portland as a as a title contender. Love Dame and CJ. I don't think they're ever gonna win a championship. Um, and part of it is just the way that the West is is shaping out, right? You all roads are gonna lead through LeBron, and if not, you've got so many other really really good teams that it's gonna be tough for them. Um, I think that the West belongs to the Lakers. The, the Warriors, you hate to see it. What happened to Steph? I mean, what happened to Clay? Um, I, I thought that that would be a team that would be you'd have to watch out for, um, but. If I was a betting man and I could bet every shoe, I should probably try to see if I could bet any money on these liquors real quick, see if I cash out. Yeah, I mean, you could go to New Jersey. I think so. You'd be good. But, but Christian, <laughs> before I get you out of here, 
I know the Brooklyn Nets is your specialty, but there happens to be another team in New York yeah. and a huge fan base that is just dying yeah. for something good to happen. And that's the New York Knicks. We saw what Leon Rose did this offseason. They add Obi Top and draft him. Yeah. What do you think about what Leon Rose is doing and what are your realistic expectations for the Knicks this season? You know, I was at my, my pops is probably the biggest Knicks fan that I know. Uh, it, so much so that he's trying to put a cap on how many Nets games he's going to watch this season just so that he doesn't start turning into a Nets fan. Um, <laughs> but when you look at what they've been able to do, I mean, this is, I mean, I don't want to say this because it, it, it's like putting a lot of hope in a franchise that has consistently let us down year after year after year after year. But it looks like the Knicks are finally on the right track. Right. You've got I, I think, number one, a lot of people made a big deal about going to sign Tom Thibodeau versus going to sign a new head coach, maybe somebody fresh with a with a new type of offensive mind. I thought that the Tibbs hire was was spot on. You need somebody when, when you look at the last couple of years in New York, you know, a lot of the losing. Sure, they didn't have the roster on paper. Right. Like no matter what, no matter how you cut it, last year's roster was not going to get you 40 wins. But there's just a certain level of effort that you have to come to that floor with night in and night out. And if you're playing for a guy like Tom Thibodeau, you will not see the floor if you don't come with that effort. And if you lack on that effort, he's going to pull you right now. So it, I think that the hire was perfect. You, you know, off rip, you're going to be a team that competes and off rip, you're going to be a team that that has intention to the de well attention to the details and intentionality on the defensive end. Right. And that, those are two things that matter. Then you go and you number one, you still got R.J. Barrett. Right. And I think RJ, when, when you don't have enough spacing on the floor for a guy like RJ, who's left handed and his predic whose game is predicated a lot on driving, uh, you, you're, you're just not going to have the best result. So I think now you, you're, you're going, you're going to space that floor out a little bit more. Uh, you get a guy like Obi Toppin, who's a hometown hero, he's from Brooklyn. You know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't really get much better than that. Um, and then you, you, you're just kind of like, you're not skipping the steps. I think the biggest thing that they did was not try to blow it up and go get Chris Paul or Russell Westbrook, right? If they would have made one of those moves, I would have been singing a completely different tune, right? But this is a team that's sticking to the, the sticking to the plan, at least for now, in developing their talent and, and creating a culture of guys who are going to work hard and compete. And that is something that I can say the Knicks have not had for the last three plus years. And that is why I think they're on the right path. And who knows, man? I think it, the East is so open towards the bottom where, like, anybody can get into a playoff spot with 35 wins. Um, I'm not saying that the Knicks are going to win 35 games, but I'm, they're definitely not going to be as bad as they were last year. Right? I think that goes out the window. And I think half of your wins or half of your result is based on competing. Right. And if you've got a team that was not competing to 100 percent last year, now they're going to be competing 110 percent. And they're going to get those wins against number one teams that are taking it off because they think the Knicks are trash. Yeah. Number two teams that aren't necessarily competing as hard as them. Right. Those are those are wins that they're going to get just by virtue of competing hard. So I think the Knicks might stumble into 30 wins this year. And if you stumble into 30 wins, you can get 33 to 35. You get 35 wins. You're the eighth seed. Right. So I don't want to say that the Knicks are going to be a playoff team, but they're definitely not going to be as bad as they were last year. And uh, I, I can't wait. I'm, I'm actually excited to see what, what they do, because, number one, the spotlight's not on them. Right. The spotlight's on Brooklyn. Right. And, and I think, number one, that's a dose of reality. Right. Like this is the premier franchise in Brooklyn. And the Knicks could have been in this position. Right. The Knicks could have gotten Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. But for whatever reason, that that wasn't what happened. Um, and I think now they're understanding that you kind of just have to put your head down, get the work done, and grind it out. And I think that's, that's what they're going to do, which is why I'm excited for them. Brooklyn Nets, NBA beat reporter for the New York Daily News. And if you follow him on social media, he is a chef on the low, too, oh, has man. another job on the side. <laughs> Christian Winfield. Christian, appreciate you taking the time, bro. Thanks for joining one-on-one -on -one with us. My man, you know I'm doing this interview in my kitchen right now, so. <laughs> I, you yeah, about to throw down something. That's what I'm thinking. Possibly. We'll see. We'll <laughs> see. We'll see. My man, you, thanks for having me. Thank you. That is Christian Winfield, NBA Brooklyn Nets beat reporter for the New York Daily News.